All right, well, welcome. Uh, my name is Dave Lowe. I'm the CEO of ISI Federal here in Maryland. And uh, before we get started, I want to give you just a high-level overview of, of how we can interact with this, because I want it to be interactive with everybody. we got a special guest that's coming along, maybe a couple of special guests, in fact, um, that we're going we're gonna to dive down into some of the 8A world a little bit. But you can ask questions either through chat. There's a, there's a place down here to, to, to be able to type in a chat. In order to be able to listen to you or be able to engage with the telephone, you have to type in your audio pin. Don't type in 36. That's one from a previous uh, thing from me. But check your audio mode on the right-hand side, and you'll see uh, that you can enter that, that pin. Um, I think we got Steve online. Is that you, Steve? Yes, I am, Dave. Excellent. Great. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get there in just a minute. Just a little bit about ISI Federal. We're located near BWI Airport between uh, Baltimore and Washington in Elkridge. Um, here's some of our clients. We, we span the spectrum as far as the type of clients that we serve uh, from services as well as size. We have some big boys like, Nor like Northrop and Coastal Sunbelt. And then we have smaller companies that we help to, to penetrate the, uh, the federal space. So there's three primary clients' needs that we serve. One is a do-it-yourself where we can help you understand the market, help you plan and train you guys to get into the federal space if you're not in it or if you're already in it. We can help you understand the market and help you plan to expand in that marketplace. Um, and we, we do that. We'll have, we'll have something that we can show you a little bit later as, as far as that's concerned. And then we have the assistant model, where we kind of assist you in the grunt work and dealing with uh, augmenting your staff um, if you need some help there, as well as managing people, if you like, to, uh, for, for us to do. Uh, and then there's a, there's a piece that got us into this market in, to begin with. And that's you outsource the whole thing. We build it, you bank it, and we guarantee results. If we're running your federal sales, we will guarantee results for your company. Um, about this particular series, we do this every second Tuesday of the month. We work through basic elements, and we co connect you with specialists like uh, Stephen Cho with uh, Glass Jacobson, who's here today. And I'm hoping that Mark Lano can join us as well to talk about some of, those, some of the 8A components. And it's really to provide a forum for you as business leaders to help you understand this particular space and ultimately how to get to the federal money, which is what we're all here to do. Uh, as far as the webinar series that's coming up in 2012, we're going to be connecting you with compliance experts like Steve and deal with some of the issues that federal contractors face. We just did this with a Vistage group. If you're not familiar with Vistage, it's, a, it's a, um, kind of a roundtable for CEOs that I'm a member of, that we, that we discuss issues that happen within, within our respective companies. And we try to help each other through those, because a lot of times we're, everybody's already, some of those people have already been through some of the difficulties. So uh, to give some legal and accounting advice, uh, to, to get you prepped if you're already a, 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 a contractor, and access to funding. And this is really important, because not every bank understands what, how to deal with federal contractors. And it just because it's a, it's a totally different world. And depending on where you are in the United States will depend on, on, uh, on their access and their ability to do that. So watch for announcements uh, in the Friends of the Firm update. We'll, we'll keep everybody posted so that you know um, what's coming down the pipe for that. So what you should expect from this particular webinar series. First of all, we're going to fire hose you. We just give you a bunch of information. It, it's designed to, and it's, it's real information. It's just not high-level stuff. It's diving down into some very specific areas as well, but we're, we're going to give you a real dose of, of things. You're going to find that we do not follow the pack. In fact, we encourage not following the pack because the pack is going after the same thing in the same places, and they're all competing against each other and beating the living bejeebers out of each other. Um, we'll give you straight talk in this, and we'll give you help where you need it. And I'll, I'm going to preface that by saying not necessarily where you think you need it, because just because some, you know, the, the, the standard thought process, either as an entrepreneur or somebody that's in the federal space, we don't follow that. And we're also going to have some shameless plugs for ISI Federal and Glass Jacobson since they're here today. So the objective is to, to connect you with some things that we think we can help you out with. Uh, and, and since this is a free webinar, you just kind of have to put up with that. So today I'm going to introduce uh, Stephen Cho. He is with Glass Jacobson. He, he handles compliance issues within the federal space. It's kind of touching on some of the things that we're going to be branching out into in 2012. 
he, he sets things up so that you, for auditing, he, he can participate in that, and he's an 8A specialist. He understands the components that are necessary in order to do that. And we, Steve, you want to say hello for a second? Hey, Dave. Uh, this is Steve Cho. Thanks for having me today, Dave. Uh, glad to be on your program. So today we try to uh, discuss some of the 8A issues, and in fact, there are new regulations effective March 14th, 2011, this year. Sure. So my goal is to just highlight for you some of those changes and, and compare it to the old rule for those who, who are already in the 8A program might be familiar with, so you know that what to expect and what changes you might need to make. That's great. And we'll, 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 what we'll do is we'll, we'll get into that in just a few minutes. I'm going to do a high-level overview, <clears throat> first of all, for the agenda. We're going to do a federal market overview. We'll talk about exactly what you, you were talking about there, Steve, with, with 8A eligibility, how that fits in with your planning of 2012. Whether you're eligible or whether you're not, it can still play a role in your planning structure for 2012. And ultimately, how do you get to market your company into the federal space finding primary decision makers and working with what we call influence clusters. So we'll define what that means so that you can have an understanding of what's happening out in the marketplace and get away from where everybody else is going and be able to carve out a place for you in the federal government and how you can do that by jump-starting. We have a program that we have uh, that you can, you can take advantage of for your uh, 2012 federal program. So real quick, about the federal market, it, everybody knows it's, it's absolutely enormous. It's $425 billion, give or take, whatever, you know, there may be some cuts coming down the pipe or whatever, but even if you cut 10% over $425 billion, you're still talking about an enormous, enormous federal market. There's 2.5 million contracts, and I want you to remember that number, because we're going to come back to that in a, in a little bit later. And 23% of these, this business is supposed to be set aside for small business. And not all agencies actually meet that. But the feds buy everything, pencils and pens and computers and telephones and electrical services, engineering services, people that dig up the streets and hang on poles, everything that you can imagine the federal government buys. And they buy what you sell as well. Um, and they do it locally, internationally even, in, in, um, either through the military or through other areas of presence around the world. There are opportunities for you to be able to, to take advantage of, whether in the continental uni United States or externally. There are 85,000 or so buyers that have decision-making authority and ability to be able to spend money every single day, and that's what they do every day. And they are the number one customer in the world, and that's why we're all here. We're trying to figure out how to best penetrate the number one customer of the world with what you have and what you supply. Now, with all that, most of the companies fail when they get into the federal space. 79%, and I was just meeting with a friend of mine that, got, that helped me out a long time ago. He, he was heading up GSA for a good while. 79%, his name's Jim Williams, by the way, 79% um, lose their GSA schedule. 48% get no dollars at all. Just because you get a GSA schedule doesn't mean you get any money. 31% don't reach their $25,000 minimum. That means almost 80% of your competition disappears because they don't know how to market, and you don't want to be one of those folks. We've got to get you to a place where you can market yourself or market for you in the federal space. Now, this also includes 8A, service-disabled, veteran-owned small business, women-owned small business, any of these folks. Nine, five out of nine of these 8As don't get a dollar after they go through the process of, of actually getting their 8A certification. Most 8A gra 8As graduate and then disappear. Now, some of that, that's pretty good because they build up a nice little nest egg and they, they sell their business or they, they wind up going away after their 8A disappears and, and they're done and they're sitting on the beach drinking Mai Tais. That's great, but not all. In fact, most of them don't really take advantage of their 8A status. And the average cost, this can cost you between $20,000 and $175,000 to try and fail. This is where we want to get you away from, make sure that you're investing your money in the right place, that you're ready to get into the federal marketplace so that you can win. So how does this happen? 
The reason why this happens is because they don't understand the market, they don't have a plan, they don't dedicate resources, whether it's internally or externally, dollars included, and they don't know how to measure success before the money starts to roll in. You've got to have a way to be able to measure your success, and that's one of the other things that we can do. And the one thing that we don't want you to do is dip your toe in. If you're thinking about dipping your toe in the federal marketplace, do me a favor, take 50 grand, go to Vegas, put it on red, and let it rip. Because I'm telling you, you're going to have more fun than if you try to just dip your toe in, and it will take, take you a whole lot less time to either lose that money or double your money, just like that. So the, the answer here that we're after is to help you avoid some of these pitfalls and get you on the right track for doing this and then absolutely not giving up. You have to have persistence and perseverance if you want to play in the federal space. It's a game. It's a different kind of game, and, and Steve's going to go into some of these pieces. What we're about is we're about removing the obstacles to your federal sales your entire process by helping you target, position, and leverage relationships so that you can gain access and increase. If you already are a federal contractor, great. Most of our clients are already federal contractors that we help expand in the marketplace. We help them in broaden their horizons and get out of just their, 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 uh, their circle of influence to outside and be able to help them uh, maximize other areas where people are spending the money. And they're all over the place. You'd be amazed at how many agencies there are. And if you, instead of going to the Army, because the Army's buying everything, you start looking at some of the other agencies that are spending money for what you provide. And we're all about the win. So now, Steve, I'm going to give you control of, the, of the, this thing here. Let me see if I can get you, give you keyboard and mouse control. Go ahead and try that and see if you're there. Again, this is okay, Steve Dave, Cho. Yes, I'm on. Yeah, I think you're on. Okay. Is it working? Let's see. Let me try my with well, the keyboard. No, nope, doesn't look like I have control. Hang on a sec. Give five. mouse control to you. Here we go. Sorry, I that was my mistake. Now try it. There we go. You're up. Oh, here we go. Okay. Now sure. I can move the slides. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about the 8A programs. I know some of you guys in the audience might be in the program, so I want to highlight for you the changes effective this year, March 14th. Uh, now, I guess for those that are already in the program knows that, you know, why bother with 8A? Because there obviously strings attached, you know. So, but the advantages of being in it is enormous if you make it work. Uh, one of the major benefits is you get set aside contracts and you don't have to compete with non 8 companies. So it, what, what does that mean, Steve? You get set aside contracts. Tell, tell them what that means to be set aside. Set aside means you have to be a certified 8 participant in order to get those contracts. To even bid on the contract. You won't even see, you won't even see the opportunity unless you're an 8 right? Exactly. You have to be an 8 And in fact, you can get sole source contracts without even doing a bid up to $4 million. Up to $4 million sole source and $6.5 million for manufacturing, right? For manufacturing. Right. Okay. If you're in a program, it lasts for nine years. So it gives you time to grow your, your business and be a, a big player in the market. And when should you start planning on exiting the program? Uh, it typically, in the nine-year program is actually, it's actually a five-year development program and a four-year transition program. So, you know, but you never stop trying to change, transition out of 8A. You, 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 you start that from the beginning. As soon as you, you get know. your 8A certification, you ought to be thinking about how you're going to get out. Exactly. Start, you want to go the, beyond 8A. You want to get your GSA schedule, everything that you can get. And, and right then when the it, it, it's, and, and one of the things that Steve said earlier uh, while we were talking as we were we're practicing for this is that this is a business development program. It is not a contract program, uh, and you need you need to work this program in order to make the dollars. So go ahead. I'm sorry, Steve. That's exactly right. It's it's not a guaranteed contract. Once you're in the program, you have to still know the market, know the customer, like Dave can show you how to do in order to get the contract. But you're in much better place with 
in the program to get contracts. So you gain access to set aside contracts and so what does that mean to some of the folks that can't necessarily get an 8A? We're going to go through some of the specifications of, of what it takes to get there. Uh, but we, you can also team or partner with somebody, right? Well, exactly. This is a uh, SBA Mentor Portal J program where, you know, larger firms that are non 8 firms can do joint ventures and be a mentor, mentor to a 8 program, basically participating in 8 contracts. Uh, the only caveat is that the 8 firm has to do 51% of the work, but 49% is still really good. <laughs> It, it's still really good, and not only that, there's some margin protection here built into the 8A program because you're not competing against everybody and their mother, and you have That's the ability right. to then to then uh, you know take take I will take 49 percent of you know 10 million dollars, then 100 percent of nothing. Right, all and day, a lot of those are so source contracts you know, that you don't have to incur a lot of cost to secure. Exactly. Very good. Okay. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, so to be qualified for the 8A, you got to be you got to meet both socially and econo economically disadvantaged, um, and the company has to be 51% owned by those individuals that are socially and economically disadvantaged, and we'll explain those in the later slides. Socially disadvantaged, uh, the first four listed, they're presumed to be socially disadvantaged. African Americans, Hispanic, Asian, Native Americans. Other individuals not listed may also be admitted, but it's a higher, really higher burden of proof on the applicant. You need to basically have a rocking uh, narrative of why you are being disadvantaged. Yeah, yeah. The, the the key is in that narrative is being able to write that narrative that is so persuasive, um, and this includes women, right? Physically handicapped. This isn't just minorities that are handicapped or women. This right. is this is also for for that those that can prove that they're socially disadvantaged in some form or fashion, and this this is where. Getting, having somebody like Steve to help in the process of, of that, knowing which strings to pull and the way to be able to position you as the owner of the company can help a tremendous amount, a tremendous amount. Right. Some clear examples of uh, uh, disadvantage uh, other than the, the races is, you know, if you are physically handicapped, you can be qualified. If you lack of access to a traditional education, you can also be qualified. And but just don't think that just because you are women owned small business, you're automatic you'll be automatically to be qualified. In fact, statistics shows over ninety percent of small owned women business failed in getting an eight A. Okay? And that's why we talked about getting that uh, socially disadvantaged narrative and make it as strong as believable as you can. Will did they did they difference. fail because they did they fail because they weren't qualified or did they fail because the narrative wasn't very good? The narrative or the application wasn't put together as you know the narrative wasn't strong. You just cannot base it on that you're just a woman that you will be qualified. You have to prove it. You have to prove that you're a woman. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> you have to prove that you are <laughs> disadvantaged. Disadvantaged. I'm kidding. Go ahead. Beyond just a woman. Right. Okay. Uh, this new rules uh, sets a standard for what is economically disadvantaged. Uh, new rules passed, actually effective March 14 this year. Three criteria: your adjusted net worth for initial uh, uh, eligibility is 250k, and 750k for staying in the program. It allows growth during the your nine-year term. So what does it mean by net worth? Uh, it does not include your principal residence. So that's where one area you can park a lot of your, your net worth. doesn't count. Your IRA, individual retirement accounts, does not count. So take some um, 
retirement planning there? There's a bunch of things that, that wind up, if, if you're looking into this, before you even get to the place of, of, of doing this, you want to make sure that you're set up for being able to obtain it and maintain it over the course of the time so that you can get the maximum benefit out of this program. But you need to set yourself up first. Don't, don't just dive into it. Make sure that you're talking to somebody like Steve who can help you understand the, the way that the game works so that you get these adjusted net worth figures, your, your, uh, your overall asset value, and all those pieces. Go ahead, Steve. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just want to make sure people understand that don't just jump. Plan, then take, take your steps very strategically in anything like this. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up either, one, to be rejected, or two, to fail after you get it. So let's not do that. Good point, Dave. A uh, few more points on the uh, adjusted net worth. For those individuals that are married and have a spouse, okay, it's important how you title the assets that you and your spouse own. Uh, before the new rule, the SBA rule is, is, uh, was not clear. And some states, you know, have like uh, community property rules. Basically means if, if you're in a state that has a community property rule, if a spouse owns a property, title in himself or in his or her own name, if you're in a community property state, that, according to the law of the state, that property is jointly owned by two, 50-50. The SBA new rule com came out and clarified that. Says regardless of if, if you're in a community property state or not, if a, a property is owned, titled by a spouse, it is wholly owned by that spouse. It does not count towards the other spouse's net worth. So that's a good and thing. And that's, that's right. That's another place that you can, you can maneuver your assets to be positioned so that you can take advantage of this particular program and prove that you are economically disadvantaged. Correct. It's called like playing a game, but it uh, it's, can be done. That's right. Now, this next criteria of being economically disadvantaged is the personal income. This is new. It wasn't, didn't exist before this March 14th rule, 250K and 350K. And personal income would be your W-2 wages. Now, for those that are S-Corp owners and LLC or partnership owners, the pass-through income from the pass-through entity does not count, okay, only your wages. There's another loophole right there. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Total assets, also a brand new rule, four million max for initial eligibility, six million for continued eligibility. And again, this and plays a role in in identifying those assets properly in relation to you, your spouse, who it is that's going to be um, the the primary owner of this entity of or whatever you know of your company this is where you need some really good insight to figure out where to put these things and and how they're classified exactly you can be really wealthy and still qualify for this program with proper planning so next we talked about a few additional changes that's a really important uh, first one is the excess withdrawal she will uh, the SBA 8A program is meant to be uh, for individuals to grow the small business and, and keep the money in the business to grow it. So they limit the amount of money that you can take out. So that's why they have this limit. If you are a sale with up to a million, you can only withdraw 250000 a year from the business. That's, that does not include your salary. This will be draws like dividends distribution to shareholders, partners, etc. cetera. Uh, and then 400,000 max with sales over 2 million. Now this is in contrast to the old rule. The old rule is more subject to interpretation, which is basically about you can withdraw up to 15% of your annual sales gross receipts. But the old rule includes your compensation in the withdrawal. So this is a drastic change from the old rule. 
Next is the reporting requirements. What financial statement you need if you are in the program, okay? Audit the financial if your sales is over 10 million. Review financial between two and 10 and compiled or management prepared if you're under two million. The new rules, these thresholds are exactly double that of the old rule. So they're getting a little, little bit better. Uh, it, it doesn't cost you as more if you're between two and 10 because you, you now you only need a review versus before you need a, uh, an, an audit which is cost more. So that's it. That's, that's basically the, the compliance section of this. And then uh, the timeline, as Dave have here, is you basically need to be in the business for two years to prove that you have a potential for success and to be and able to get into the 8A. Long, how long does it take to get uh, your 8A generally? It could take anywhere from uh, uh, three to six months. You know, so I have a client actually came in, tried it for three years, didn't get it because they couldn't get the uh, the net worth statement correct, the financial statement wasn't prepared properly, as we keep telling them, but they wouldn't assist them, assist them in what's wrong or how to get it fixed. So they came to me, we fixed it. Uh, they, they, after we, we resubmitted the application, he got it in about three months. About three but months. For, for him, that was a long process because it, from the beginning, it wasn't done properly. Right. And, and that's if there's anything that I, I want to encourage the, the folks that are joining us today is plan, plan, plan. Find somebody, if it's not Steve, find somebody that knows this stuff. It doesn't have to be Steve, but I can tell you Steve knows this stuff. And, and one, you know, how, how would you go about getting started in this? I would say plan first and then work that plan, uh, and then you'll probably, you'll probably save time, you'll probably save money, and you'll, you'll be in the program a whole lot faster than if you try to do it yourself. Most of the people that I know that have done it themselves have taken over a year. Yep. And, yep. and they've done it, or they failed at doing it, and they're like, I tried and tried and tried, and I couldn't do it, and I don't believe it can be done. So they've, they, they've, they've structured their own answer by saying, it can't be done. And I'm telling you, it can be done, and, and folks like Steve can help you do it. How much does it generally cost to get an 8A? Uh, once you start the process, I mean, as far as the accounting fees goes, you know, in getting your correct financial and getting your net worth and stuff all lined up properly, it costs anywhere from 2500 to 5000 maybe, depending on the, the complicated, uh, how much time you need from us. You know, if you can do a lot of it yourself in, in getting the basic stuff filled out, and actually the SBA has a lot of information on their website on how to do it. And they've and made it a lot easier to be able right. to do the, the application. We can just provide you so with support in, in the area of, of accounting and basically, you know, keep your costs low that way. And, and then if you need some further assistance, I know other folks that actually do the whole thing, uh, work with Steve and, and do the whole thing. So the, your objective here is to, to get your house in order and then go about the the process of doing the application, and if you, if you have a little bit of assistance from somebody like Steve, he can help you get to the right place and, and have the right verbiage, especially in the narrative of what they're looking for. Uh, now, does it, once you get the 8A, money falls from the sky and you make a billion dollars, right? Isn't that how it works, Steve? Absolutely not. In <laughs> fact, as you might have mentioned before, the 8A is not a contracting program, it's, it is a business development program. It gets you to get started, gets you into, into the door, gets you access to be, to have the opportunity to, to get contracts, but it's up to you, the business owner, to get those contracts. And that's why in the federal marketplace, you need the expertise of the procurement process from somebody like Dave. Uh, exactly. So. And that's why we're really here, is to, is to kind of help folks understand that it doesn't matter what you have. GSA doesn't get you anything, and IDIQ doesn't get you anything, a BPA doesn't get you anything. You have got to work whatever, th whatever you have. And what we're, not, we're talking about, these aren't like silver bullets by any stretch. You need to use these as levers. They're lever to leverage your ability to be able to market in the space. Because once you do, actually before we move on into leveraging that, if you have any questions, again, 
you can uh, hang on one sec. I'm going to see if I can check to see if there's any questions so far in your in your chat. Um, you can chat me questions, or you can raise your hand in um, in your in, in, and I can I can turn your microphone on if raise you your hand, Dave. I, you don't see my hand. I, I don't see your hand. Um, <laughs> Here, Jason. Jason has a question. Hang on a second. I'm unmuting you, Jason. Are you there, Jason? Hey, Jason. Jason Caridi. I'm not. I don't see you. I don't see you there. Um, I, I muted you back. It sounded like you were typing. Um, if yet, oh, here's a question. Jason did have a question. Hang on a sec. He's chatting it. Um, Looks like there's a question. Hang on, guys. I'm going to get better at this here. You're here. Okay, hold on a second. Um, I unmuted you, Jason. Did you type in your um? Oh, you have no audio in your computer. Okay, well that doesn't that doesn't help. Okay, let's see. What, what's your uh, what's your question for uh, for us? Or to, or you just raise your hand? Maybe you don't have a question, <laughs> and I called you out anyway. All right. If you have questions, just, you can chat them in here. Nope, no questions. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we can always go back to to this and get into it a little bit further if we want to. I'm going to go ahead and and ask the next question. Which, uh, oh, before you do that, here's Stephen's um, information. You can call him at 301-917-3040, extension 224, and and uh, his email address is there as well. And we'll pipe this out to everybody afterwards, along with the. Um, Along with the recap, so if there's anything that you that that, uh, that you'd like to know, feel free. Steve said he would be very willing and uh, and able to to talk with each one of the folks if you have any questions about the program. Um, so now you have it. Now you get your 8A or you have whatever. And you, now what? Okay, you you you've got to take this thing and leverage it in the marketplace. This can be part of your 2012 strategy. Whether you can get an 8A certification or not. It should be part of your strategy because there are pieces of this that if you go out and you find opportunities, which that's your job, is to go out and search and find opportunities. Build relationships with folks and start to develop these relationships into opportunities and then have them ask questions. Well, you, you know, if you have if you have somebody that's an 8A, we could set it aside and, and uh, make it sole sourced and then you can have your piece. And a lot of times these business relationships and you don't just want to get in with an 8A just because they're an 8A. You want to get in with someone that already that's that's working in your space along with you. You can play nice in the sandbox, or they take one piece and you take another, and you 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 have a nice joint venture piece going on, depending on what your your uh, what you have to offer and what they have to offer. But it should be part of your 2012 strategy. The first thing you need to do is understand your market. Work on your plan. Do you need a GSA? Do you have a GSA? Do you sub? Do you team? Do you joint venture with an 8A or, or women? Own? Are you women owned? Do you do look for service disabled? These are the places that you let the market determine for you where your where your direction should be. If you understand that a lot of your work is being performed in the Veterans Administration and they love to have veterans as part of the program, then you're going to want to find either a service disabled or a veteran owned small business so that you guys can team and, and make that work, unless you are one, in which case then you can have, have your certification there. Identify your strategic partners. Folks like Steve, folks like us, don't go it alone because if you do it alone, you're going to wind up expand, taking so much time that you're either going to get discouraged or you're going you're to start believing that it doesn't work. It absolutely does work, and, and you can make a very good living with the federal government. I mean, you know, Northrop and Lockheed, they're not small businesses and they're still doing quite well. Then you're going to have to dedicate resources. That means internally within your organization. And one of the things I don't want you to do is go hang it on your mediocre rep to spend, you know, 20 hours a week going after the federal work. This happens more often than not. You're not going to take your ace rep and put them out in the field and for 12 months, 18 months before you start to really get traction and you're losing all the revenue that your ACE rep is already doing. Understanding that you're going to have a ramp up time, but you're going to have to dedicate your resources internally and externally if you're, you have strategic partners to be able to do this. Set realistic goals and objectives. This is all part of your 2012 strategy. 
and find a way to be able to measure those results before the money starts to roll in. If you're not thinking about this, you have to be able to set up, okay, I need a, I need a market to this many people. It starts to dissect, it starts to break down to this. We're going to follow these opportunities over here, but we, need, we know we need relationships right here because these are the people that are buying. And that's where we want to be able to help you identify so that you can measure those results. What we recommend is a market-driven strategy. This is counter to a lot of folks, and this is one of the reasons why we love this. We'll help you alter identify alternative agencies. We know that there's a bunch of money in the Army. We know that there's a bunch of money in the Department of Defense, but everybody's chasing that money. There's other pockets and places around the United States, throughout the world, that you can have access to that fit right in your sweet spot. And if you understand what your market is, then you can understand what your sweet spot is and who is buying within that sweet spot. I can tell you, if you want a $100 million contract and you're you know, a $10 million company right now, you have one heck of a large spend to get that if you even want to participate. Why? Because you got Deloitte. You got Northrop, you got SAIC, you got Lockheed Martin, you got all these big players that have deep relationships, and you cannot just march in and say, "Hey, I'm here, and I just I'm on that money." It's not happening. So we want to help you identify the agencies and the sub agencies that are doing this, and help you develop an introduction campaign, and manage your expectations of when these things are going to happen. If you manage your, if you if you're going to go into it with the typical entrepreneur mindset where you're going to jump in this thing in 90 days you're going to measure you might as well just not do it retool what it is that you expect you can't just open up a market in Tokyo to say hey I'm going over to Tokyo I'm going to sell what I have I'm going to rent this place on on the corner of the street and I'm going to get outside I'm going to start waving my hand and say I'm here that's not the way it works you got to understand the culture you got to understand the processes and you've got to get yourself positioned and manage your expectations expectations because developing relationships take time and do you want to be this guy nobody wants this guy where you're just walking in and say hey what do you got for me today you don't you don't wake up in the morning go go out and say hey will you marry me it doesn't happen that way build your relationships build them strong so develop your relationships and this is what we call our limerick approach we leverage the relationships we influence the scope if you're not in on a project to help influence the way that this scope is being determined, then somebody else is. And it's going to be somebody that's your comp competition in most instances. We monitor for winnable opportunities, and we're going to talk about what winnable opportunities mean too. We improve our submissions, and we are ultimately capturing wins. That's what our job is to do, to help get you to this place. And let's talk about winnable opportunities for a minute. People buy from people they like. So, who are the people that buy what you sell? And how can you get them to like you? That's the question. It's not rocket science. That's how people work. So, they won't buy from you if they don't like you. That's a given, right? We don't buy from people we don't like. They can't like you if they don't know you. And they can't know you if you don't reach them, if you have no way to reach them. And I'm not just talking about picking up the phone and calling them, but you've got to reach them. You have, to, you have to build that relationship, and you can't reach them if you don't know who they are. And that's why we start. We flip that around, and we go to understanding your market first. Because if, you, if we can figure out who those people are, you can then start to build those things from the ground up. So your market-driven strategy, follow the money, who's spending that money, what they're buying, how they're buying, the preferred vehicles. Again, do they, use a, do they need eight days? Of course they do. They love that stuff because it's less work for them. But there are other preferred vehicles. Maybe they like GSA. Maybe they don't. Maybe they prefer to create a BPA and, and run it through their own contracting department. There's thousands of vehicles that are out there. Some of those are tailored for specifically for people that have your products and services. When they buy, what's their regularity? What are the NAICS PSC combinations, the NAICS codes or the industry codes? kind of like SIC codes of yesteryear, and PSEs are kind of floating underneath of those to kind of help us understand what they like to see and how they like to put things out. So we're going to talk about identifying these decision clusters. There's very few things that I own. This is one of them. These are the decision clusters, the project manager, the COTAR, and the contracting officer. These are the three legs of the stool. 
These are the people that you need to know and cover when you're doing a, a particular procurement. These clusters are all over the place. You have your project managers, your contracting officers, and your co-tars. We'll go into some of the details for those uh, because they all have different buying motives. We're going to do that another time. But these folks get together for a particular procurement. The project manager, he's responsible for driving initiatives and, and providing the scope of the project a lot of times. Not always. Sometimes the contracting officer is out there trying to figure out how to fulfill the scope. Sometimes the, the COTAR, the technical representative. These folks facilitate and determine the process. They administer the spec and the, and the technical requirements. You need to know these people. And every time one of these gets together, and sometimes the bigger the, the bigger the opportunity, because if you've got a $10 million opportunity, there's usually more than that. And if it's a $100 million or a $1 billion opportunity, there's a whole bunch of people that are involved. And the political exposure gets greater, and that's why we need to find your sweet spot. Chances are it's not up there. Chances are it's some of the smaller projects that you can get sole sourced, that you can get set aside, either just for small business you can get set aside or women-owned, or how you can help them leverage and leverage your what you have to help them make their life a little bit easier, and they're going to like you for it. So these decision clusters get together for these particular, uh, particular requirements, and they're constantly moving and they're constantly forming, and that's what we're after to find out. They're in all these different agencies. If you look at the Department of Transportation, the sub-agencies under there, the Highway Administration, FAA, whatever it happens to be, then you can start to say, okay, who are the people that are buying what you sell? And that's where we want to live. Because some of these folks are exact, they have these requirements on their desks right now, or they will be shortly. We're in a, we're in a kind of a lull right now because of the issues with the budget crisis. So if we're looking at that thing, okay, when are they going to start spending money? Well, they're going to start spending money. There's probably going to be a spike in March, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. And now it's a great time to get positioned with these folks, to start building these relationships. They are everywhere, all over the place, all over the world within these agencies and sub-agencies. And it's our, your job to find out who are the folks that are involved in your project, the roles that they have, their objectives, their buying motives. Every one of these folks has a different buying motive. Just because you do the greatest electrical services that you could possibly imagine, Guess what? The contracting officer doesn't care. He doesn't care. What he cares about is how can you help him move that piece of paper from one side of the desk to the other side of the desk easier. Now, it's not saying he doesn't care that you can't do your job, but you've you got to be able to do your job. But how can you help him? You can't help him by doing your job. You help him by understanding his world and making his life easier so that he can he can make those changes and include you. And they're all influenceable. All these folks are influenceable along the way. So what federal buyers need? They need political cover, they need technical cover, and they need pricing cover. And this is how this works. Your approach is your political cover. If you're coming in in the right way and you know the right folks and you're working this at the right angle, that's your political cover. Your technical cover is your capability, your, abil your ability to be able to deliver on your, on your, on your project. And pricing cover, that can, that can be your GSA schedule or whatever contract vehicle that you have, or leveraging your 8A, right, to be able to say, okay, well, these guys can do what they do, and here's their pricing, right? The objective is to make it easy, and I mean putting it in a nice little box and with a bow and giving it to them. And that is how you identify and deliver on what your federal buyers need so that you can give them what they need. Here's what we want you to avoid, the freeway. You hear about a few things. If, you're, if you dip into this, you start, you start talking to your small business administration person. And I actually was at an event a week and a half ago where somebody, Steve was there. Steve was there with me. And, and it was a small business yes, event. The and, SBA. And, and, and the SBA. And, and tell me if I'm telling the truth. She said, you have to call the lowest person on the totem pole and work your way up, didn't she? Yes. And she also said that you're going to need to call that person eight to ten times to get a meeting with the OSDABU, the Office of Small Disadvantaged Business Utilization. While I appreciate these people for what they can do, they have 
no decision-making authority, and they have no influence on the SCO process. So answer me a question. Why in the world are we going to just call those folks so that we can start knocking down those doors? They are gatekeepers, and they can get in your way if you're not helping them do their job. If you don't know who you're after and you're going to an OSDABU and, and the SBA people, you're not helping them do their job. The way you help them do their jobs, if you know who the end person is, your contracting officer, your program manager, usually those two people because of the authority structure that's there. If you can't help them identify those people so they can help you leverage and get a meeting with the people that have the money, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree and you're wasting all, an incredible amount of time. And I love these people for what they do, but you've got to help them do what they do. Next notifications, another free way. This is the way that you get, this is free. All these things are free. And you can get NAICS notifications out the wazoo, and you, you're, you're doing this. Any NAICS notification that's out there that they're sending information on is also available to everybody else. So that's free. Fed Biz Ops, everybody familiar with Fed Biz Ops? Fed Biz Ops is when it's hitting for full and open competition most of the time. Sometimes they're announcing 8A or their RFIs, things like that. But there's lots of competitors. Everybody's watching this. Everybody's watching it. There's lots of exposure uh, politically. There's months of work. It's a long sales cycle, average 8.3 months from the time that they have a concept to the time that they're doing award, which means, and, and some of those go on for years, by the way, where they'll come out and they'll, oh, I'll pull it back, we'll put it back out again. Oh, no, no, we're going to redo it and put it back out again. So everybody has seen this. This is how we view this. Everybody's going to the same place at the same time. And I want to take you to I'm going to take you to, to Fed Biz Ops for just one minute. And I want to show you a few things. If you haven't been there, it's not hard to get there. Do FedBizOps.gov um, and, and and you can log in. I just did this is the last 365 days, okay? Everybody see this? Last 365 days. And I want you to see something. This is one of twenty of forty one thousand six hundred and seventy nine contracts or not contracts but opportunities and some of those opportunities aren't even real opportunities that have hit the street in the last 365 days on Fed Biz Ops. If that's the case and there's two it is is this profitable for them is this profitable for you? I got a question. If we're talking about 40 42,000 contracts in the last 365 days, where in the world are the other 2.45 million? Where are the rest of them? I can tell you where they are. They're getting set aside. They're getting done through different contract vehicles that don't have to post to Fed Biz Ops. Fed Biz Ops is $25,000 and above. Anything that is $25,000 and above has to hit, should hit Fed Biz Ops, but it's not necessarily so. There are certain agencies that don't have to report at all to Fed Biz Ops, and they have their own procurement mechanisms that are already in place. So you need to be monitoring those as well. But even if they're hitting there, the problem is if it's on Fed Biz Ops, it's too late because other people have already influenced the scope, and it's being tailored towards a particular type of company, if not a particular specific company. And you say, how can that be? We have laws against that. Because people buy from people they like. And they're just working the system to be able to be able to fulfill those roles. So where are the rest of the 2.45 million? Wouldn't you rather be targeting winnable opportunities, positioning your company and leveraging relationships and winning the federal business than looking out where everybody else is? That's what we're, we're talking about. How can you get there? Find the people you need to like you and get them to like you. It's not complicated. If we're talking about procurement people, there's 80,000 plus, 85,000 actually, it's a typo. They're scattered all around the world. So the question is, who are the ones that buy what you sell? And this is where I'm going to get into shameless plugs, so be ready. ISI Federal Intelligence is the best place to find who's buying what you sell, specifically for what you do. There's plenty of databases out there that will give you NAICS codes and everything else, and you can go all over the place and do all those things. But the question is, who specifically is buying what you sell? What if, I could, what if I told you that we could find the people that are actually spending millions of dollars on what you sell? 
and we'll tell you the agencies and some of them they're in particular you know the Department of the Army Department of the Navy but what about NOAA and what about Health and Human Resources H or, or HRSA that's that's HRSA what about them these are the folks that we're after these are the folks that we're looking for for you and a winnable opportunity is if people buy from people they like you have a relationship plus a need equals a winnable opportunity if you know somebody who's who has a particular need they're going to be much more likely to lean your direction to say how should this look how how should it look Dave what where do you think requirements come from by the way they come from people like you and me we're feeding that to them in fact when we do our capabilities one of the capability statements that we work up has a sample scope of work in every single one and that way when you're feeding them your information you say oh by the way here's what it should look like and here are the certifications the classifications that are very important in, in your particular industry if you know RC DDs right RC DDs and when you're doing um, when you're doing network or or you're talking about Microsoft certifications or whatever even if it's not even applicable to what it is for this particular scope of work put it in there you'll be surprised how often they take your information and say well that makes sense that makes sense here you go boom and they put that scope of work out and they're using your verbiage in their scope of work this is how you get minimal competition 50 to 95 percent of opportunities with your in your industry have less than five competitors here's one event services 44,000 contracts this is over the course of two years 1.6 billion dollars you think you can live on a piece of, of that let's take a look at it 97 percent 1.5 billion dollars went to less than five competitors isn't this where you want to be find the people that need to like you help them like you by giving them what they need not necessarily your great qualifications giving them what they need of why they buy and they don't care about what you sell half of the people don't care about what you sell I know that sounds like a, a brain twister I got one more thing I want to ask you how much of your tax dollars are funding your competition if you're not in this space and you're not working it right your money and I'm going to be real clear your dollars are going into your competitors bank account right now right this minute what if we could give you your competitors contacts within the specific agencies that they're working now some of those folks have good relationships and you're going to need a crow by four crow, 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 crowbar and a two by four to be able to to get in there but some of them maybe not you can see in this particular instance FAA, 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 they got deep relationships in FAA. And then you have DLA where you have a zero dollar contract. That doesn't mean zero dollars necessarily. But there's a lot of, you can see that this particular competitor with Alyssa Stingley being the, the primary with $1.3 million, there's a relationship there. This is important to know because if you see something come out with your, with something that fits within your ability to deliver, and Alyssa is the contracting officer that's driving it the chances are it's wired for your co competition don't you want to know that before you spend three four weeks on or on a on a proposal response wouldn't you like to know who you have to compete against and maybe you compete really well against this competitor and you could maybe dethrone them or give Alyssa somebody else to be able to look like to look at what if you had your competitors pricing most instances we can find this to find out where you where you are in the in the scheme of things now this is GSA pricing is different than you would think you don't have to be competitive like that you may charge more for a 30 kW generator with a canopy that's okay it's according to how much you charge in the marketplace not your competition but isn't it nice to know what these folks are going out as and whether or not you want to play in that space or if there's another way that you can be able to cook that and make sure that you're, you're maintaining your margins there's ways to be able to maintain your margins with GSA pricing and it's very important if you're doing it to maintain your price your, your, your margins don't let them beat you to death on the on the negotiations so let's get your tax dollars going in your bank instead of instead of the other way around 
We can jumpstart your 2012 federal sales, and we're going to get to some questions in just a minute. Your capabilities review, this is the easiest way to engage us. It's cheap, 200 bucks. We'll take a look at your capabilities, and, and we'll, we'll massage it for you. We have federal intelligence that is now $4,500. We've incorporated some serious, serious intelligence components over the past year. And we've gotten really, really good at enhancing our intelligence. And it's, so we're, but we're, we can do that for $3,000, help you plan your market, the best $3,000 that you can spend, because it's the right people at the right agency, and it's your competitor's contacts. Today, we'll, we'll do it for, for uh, $3,000 for, for just for those two pieces. We'll do both of those pieces for, for today for $3,000. And again, that's where we are. Hang on a second. I'm get. I'm stuck in a. There we go. Then right. This is the right time to be working in this space, and I'll tell you why. If you take a look, every one of these spikes is September. Everybody knows. Well, a lot of people know. Use it or lose it spending happens in September. Fiscal year end for the federal government is September, and we're planning everything we do around September for all of our clients. Because and, and part of that is we better start developing the relationships now if we want to be positioned for September. But we also have a mini spike because of the wacky budget components that are happening right now. And we're expecting a, a mini spike. It's a great time to develop business. Mini spike in March-April timeline is what we're expecting happened last year. And positioning for September 2012. This gives you nine months of preparation of being able to reach these folks and build those relationships. If you're not doing it now, you will not make September 2012 because you have to be in front of these folks before that. They're not going to marry you in August. That's your first tap with them. So get your dollars into your bank with, with the program that we have today. Feel free to, to take advantage of that. If you want to get in front of the right people, that's the right way. If there's another program that we have where we have a federal blitz. We'll do an introductory blitz. We'll get you in front of those folks. We need to do the intelligence first, but we'll do that, and we'll do that for, for a discount for 4780 if you're part of the program for this year. It's all about the win, and here's some additional resources. We're running at, we're getting to 12 o'clock, so we're getting close to the end. But we'll, the limit process, how it works, we have a free uh, government handbook that you can download from isifederal.com as well as free survey and RSS feeds. And you can always send me a LinkedIn invite. Love to be able to connect with people on a regular basis. Again, announcements for next year, for, for what's coming up, new compliance webinar series. Um, we'll be doing some specialized webinars for women-owned small business in January. That is another component of the 8A program, often referred to as the 8M program, where we can, we're going to start helping direct uh, in, that, in that as well. So upcoming webinars are going to be proposal writing, GSA schedule development, and what contracting officers need in order to be able to choose you. So Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year. If you don't fall into those categories, then Happy Holidays. Uh, and we're very glad to have you. Uh, now we're going to get to finally to some questions. And um, if you have any questions for anybody, I think Steve is still here. Yes. Steve, uh, Mr. White just joined us. I think it's a question for you. I just want to say hi. <laughs> hi, David. Okay, who's, who's that? It's Doug, David. Hey, hey Doug, I'm, how are you? <laughs> fine, how are you doing? I Very had to join late. I was at, a, at an economic development meeting, and uh, they were talking about federal uh, dollars and federal contracts at this meeting in, uh, for the Washington metro area. And I will say that, um, you know, as contract dollars, uh, you know, will will dry up probably not as bad here as it will be in the rest of the country yep. as far as budgets, but I will say that uh, targeted marketing and targeted selling such as yours probably be a lot more valuable uh, as, uh, as the pool shrinks a little bit and the government is thinking of cutting back on benefits for its workers so it doesn't have to outsource so much, uh, and like so much and they're insourcing more. Yep, there there is a there is a uh, there is a move to insource, um, which sometimes actually helps some areas like staffing agencies and things like that. They can they can benefit from those. You'll you'll see the pendulum swinging back and forth on a regular basis, yeah. and uh, this is one of the times where you're you are absolutely correct that that there there's 
there's always swings happening. It's not like they just every, everything always run everything runs the same way all the time. And that's one of the things that we we love to help folks with is that hey, you, first of all, don't panic. You just got to go look to see where things are moving and ebbing and flowing. Um, there's a lot of money spent on our spending, as you know, uh, yeah. that got passed through down to to the the, the states and the local levels. Um, so yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And so well, uh, I that's guess why. Say some some uh, targeted services such as yours are just that much more valuable, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I would agree entirely. Of course, I'm a little half biased. <laughs> you know, my, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm only half biased. Now, now, Deborah, I um I'm having some technical issues being able to see the questions. Let me see something real quick. There we go. Hold on a second. I got it. All right. Woo. Here we go. We got a bunch of questions here. All right. Um. In the narrative, are names required when writing about economical discrimination, i.e., promotions denied because of race, lack of raises, etc.? Are company names required to be listed that did this? That's a great question, Gregory. That is not in my world, and I'm going to turn that over to uh, to Steve. Um, did you hear that, Steve? In the narrative, are names required when writing about economical discrimination? In other words, an uh, ABC company didn't were that didn't that they didn't pay me what I was worth because I was XYZ. Um I wouldn't name any specific name for for say because that's just more uh, data out there, you know, just uh be more discreet I would Okay. You know you can you can give examples, I wouldn't name actual names. Yeah. If uh, I, of course if they ask you you could you could of course, you, it. yeah, you, you have that as a backup, but don't put it on there. On okay. The application. So we don't do that. Um, Jason says he had to run, but he's going to contact Steve later on. Take care. Okay, great. Can no you problem. speak about joint venturing with a non-8A firm if you are a, a new 8A company? Great question, Dana. That's a that's a super question. What what what's your answer to that so far? Oh, joint. Okay, if you are a company, you can form joint ventures with a non a company. Uh, you know, because they, especially to the mentor protege program, they can a bigger company can act act as as your mentor and provide management assistance. Can provide you with funding assistance and basically like a big brother taking you into the federal space. But the a a pro company has to do at least forty percent of the work. In a joint give me, venture. Give me one second. Let me see if Dana's there. Dana, are you available by phone too? Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Can I, you hear me? I can hear you. We can hear you oh. now. I, I unmuted okay. you. Um, what 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 is your business, Dana? Uh, accounting, CPA work, management consulting, financial. Hold. You got to hold your ears, Steve. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Um, you're in the same business. Yeah, you're you're in essentially in the same business, and this is one place where, irrespective of what you do, first of all, the government buys everything. We know this, and secondly, if you can, if you find an opportunity where, let's say, you have limited resources, where you can do a significant component part of that, or maybe you're going to need some time to be able to ramp up. But how many folks work with you, Dana? But that's exactly what I'm talking about. I've primarily been side by side, bringing on consultants and contractors as needed based on the contract and the size of contract. Exactly. So you would, when you win a contract, but the most important thing is to say, hey, I have, if you have an opportunity, then a large business would be an absolute moron if they didn't want to team with you because essentially you're saying, hey, I'm going to give you a, a portion of what I have so that you can augment my staff while we ramp up and I'll still do at least 51% of the work, but I need you as my resource to be able to, to do this job and do it completely and do it not just satisfactorily. I want to I wanna rock and roll on this particular project. So that, that's where we, we love to be flipping that around because you already have the opportunity and, and you want to find the right, the right person to joint venture with. Um, and and, and like, like Steve said, there are lists of people um, and, the, and the mentoring program as well where you can uh, 
you can absolutely, absolutely. Do I, to, uh, do I have to identify that I'm in a mentoring program or use the specific companies that are listed as mentors? Well, it's a place to go. You don't have to use any okay. particular company per se. But if they're already connected in the federal space, then you have extra leverage, right? If you, if if you're, let's say it's, um, pick pick somebody, Deloitte, right? You say, okay, you go to Deloitte and say, I have an opportunity. It's a it's a five million dollar opportunity or a three million dollar opportunity, and it, it's gonna it's three million. It's gonna be sole sourced, and I'm in line to do that. Um, I'd like you to be my my support structure, and you know that Deloitte has has mentorship programs because they're they're there. That's what they do. So they're they're enormous, and they have, you have all the you have all the then have access to all the past performance at Deloitte and um, and all their great accolades to be able to apply to your not just your resume but your proposal. Does that make sense? Right. So do I market then? Can I market ahead of time by saying that's one of my plans to venture cool. or work with? Yeah. One of the things of more capacity. Yes, but what I would say is, if you take your mark, if we, if you do a market assessment or intelligence, whatever you want to call it, and you say, okay, here's my market, and here are the primes that are winning, and then you start talking to the contracting officers internally, because you're eight A and and you have you're you're capable and you're an eight A, right? Yeah. You're talking to the contracting officers, the procurement people, as well as the project managers, program managers potentially, and you're funneling. You're looking at that as your market segment, and the, and you talk. Let's say you talk to to Trista, and Trista says, "Well, we do all our work through this contract vehicle, or we we're you know we have relationships with Deloitte." In which case, then you take that that connection because Trista is not going to introduce you to just anybody. She's going to say, "Hey, talk to John. He's the project manager internally within Deloitte and Touche, and they are the ones." He's the one that you need to talk to, and you know it, we could always work out something where, you know, we're always looking for eight A's. So you know, let them know that I have a project, or you might want to talk to them anyway. Start building the relationship because there's a whole lot of people that are banging down Deloitte's doors to be eight A's or or subs to their to their prime, right? In this instance, you have you're getting referred to from internally to the government to. The, the folks that are getting the checks from this guy in the government, they're absolutely going to talk with you, and they're going to want to talk with you. But a vendor day where you're up, again, you know, you got you got 1,000 people that are going to go see Deloitte on a vendor day, and who knows if you're ever going to reach the right person. Right. But if you, if you use this strategy where you know the person internally in the government, the government refers you over to this person who's the player in Deloitte, you're going to at least get FaceTime. Now you could still screw it up and blow it, but by right. and large, at least you're in the right place, right? Right. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, it does. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Anybody else have hand raised questions? Uh, Deborah, did we ask? Did we answer you, Deborah? Hold on one second. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed your yours there. Deborah, you still there via phone, or I know. It's it's getting late, and I want to be very respectful of everybody. We have some good some good questions. Um, one of the other questions is, how long does it take to do uh, by computer? Um, her De Deborah's question. Hang on one sec. Let me remute that. Um, how long does it take to complete the process and receive the 8A pr approval? It depends on what you do. And it depends on how you go about it. I've seen people last over a year, and we were just talking about that a little earlier, where you'll wind up having um, three to six months is if you have some assistance and you you have the your right narrative and you have your financials in order. Three to six months, you can you can get your eight A. So does that answer that question? Um, next question. You're you're certainly welcome. <laughs> uh, the next question. Um, how long does it take to do the intelligence? The intelligence that we run takes three and a half weeks, uh, and we, we look specifically into your your world, identify exactly what it is that you need um, as far as the contacts that are there, and and uh, and that takes that research takes about three and a half weeks. So it's perfect timing because we'll finish it up 
first of the year, you can we, we can have a, a, a review and then uh, look at that as it's about 80% of your federal strategy will be in that intelligence packet. And then you'll have the ability to be able to, to start your marketing right off in January and be building that through February, March, and then into to 2012. Remember that we're coming to the end of the first quarter for the federal government. October, November, December is the first quarter. And so you're, you're coming into to the second quarter and you're going to start to see the spend at, towards the end of, of the second quarter. And again, as Doug was saying, we're, we're, looking at, we're looking at some folks that are holding on to their money right now. I know that's a shock. Nobody's doing that anywhere else, right? So we're looking at them holding on to that money and it's going to start to, to, to break loose. And there will be low-hanging fruit that, that's there. It's not free. And just because you have a GSA schedule or, or your 8A doesn't mean that you're going to get it by any stretch. If you need more information, um, love to talk with you and, and have you at any time. Uh, my office number here is, is here as well as my cell. Cell's by far the best place to reach me, 410-440-8527 and dlow at isifederal.com. Again, um, we really appreciate having everybody on board and, um, and the folks that, that have been here. Feel free to reach out at any time. I know we mentioned before with Steve. We'll, re, uh, we'll, we'll get the, uh, the recap email out a little bit later today, maybe early tomorrow, and that way you all can, can reach out to Steve directly if it's something that you're, you're interested in doing. And uh, so finally, if there are no additional questions for us, um, you're all, thank you, a bunch of thank yous there. You're all welcome <laughs> for, for others. Love to have you. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and just ask you, you I hope you have a blessed time this holiday uh, with family, and uh, and enjoy your your time together as uh, with family and and friends. I'm really looking forward to it myself, um, and being able to catch everybody and after the first of the year. Before then, feel free to reach out to me, and I and will be glad to be able to um, to work with you. Thanks so much. Have a great holiday. You're welcome, guys. Bye.